it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here and to share the stage with so many distinguished colleagues, brilliant speakers, all in honor of Carl Sagan. And I want to in insert a bit of history into this as well, because more than 47 years ago, in late August and early September 1977, NASA launched the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft to study the outer solar system. They are now the farthest flung human-made objects in the universe more than 81, now more than 81 trillion, et cetera, feet from our celebration today. Both continue to relay data to Earth, and I suspect that some in this audience may have in fact seen some of the recent news articles about the successful reboot of Voyager 1's S-band radio, which had been silent since Saturn, to fix some of the corrupted code that had in fact hobbled its otherwise strong data transmission. Voyager continues to make headlines even 50 years or nearly 50 years after its launch. But I'm not here to talk to you about Voyager's incoming transmissions. My focus is the outbound communicative medium mounted prominently on the main body of each spacecraft, doubtless some of the most expensive real estate in the universe. Produced at the mere cost of $18,000, or about two, thousand, two thousandths of a single percent of Voyager's total budget, a gold-plated copper phonograph record rides along. Etched into their grooves are approximately 90 minutes of music, an acoustic collage of earth sounds, spoken greetings in 55 languages, most of them recorded here in Ithaca, and 18, 118 encoded images, the last a typed memo from President Carter, which is perhaps the first time that someone skirted a hard word length count limitation by posting an image of text. This record, Carter writes, represents our hope and determination and our goodwill in a vast and awesome universe. But I'm also not here to pay, tri pay tribute to President Carter's intergalactic res uh, uh, rhetoric, but to the cosmic vision of Carl Sagan, who had been charged to place a message aboard, aboard the Voyager spacecraft. And Sagan assembled a remarkable team, including Andrian, who you heard from earlier, and a mere eight months before Voyager's launch date, they settled on a long-playing phonographic record. And Sagan tells us it was Frank Drake's idea, another Cornelian. It was a brilliant, but hardly obvious, spark of inspiration. The extended play record, which spins at 16 and two-thirds revolutions per minute, was a very old format, introduced in the late 1930s and primarily used for talking records and Muzak-like machines in the 1950s. It was long forgotten by the late 70s. Imagine, for instance, sending a Betamax to Jupiter on the Europa Clipper, because who knows, maybe Chuck Berry has found a new audience there, because you may have heard of, uh, of, of Steve Martin's quip, if we hear from aliens, they'll say, send more Chuck Berry. That decades-old format had the benefit, though, of endurance. It was not only long playing, but inscribed in the right medium, it was long lasting impervious to the decay that would destroy any magnetic tape that dared to travel beyond our atmospheric protections. Each record is further protected by a cover that you see here, in fact, that you saw on the wall behind um, uh, Bill Nye when he was speaking earlier, a cover that's electroplated with ultra-pure uranium-238, an embedded atomic clock that records the record's original release date, at least for the next 4.5 billion years. The cover also bears engraved symbols that you can see that detail how the record is to be played and its images decoded with a ceramic stylus and cartridge included for free on each spacecraft, like a decoder ring in a cereal box. In the event that Voyager is discovered by intelligent life in worlds unknown or maybe by future humans, if technology outpaces its modern maiden voyage and the record boomerangs back into human orbits. This cover is itself a record of its own function, its own chronology and its own port of point of origin, all expressed in an optimistically universal language of mathematics. The phase transition of a hydrogen atom, the decay of uranium-238, and the frequency of pulsars. But the record that it protects is more than a mathematical object. We are feeling creatures. That's what Sagan wrote in Murmurs of Earth, an account of the record's production published by Sagan and his team in 1978. 
The inclusion of music uniquely enabled by the phonographic medium offered, he writes, quote, a credible attempt to convey human emotions. Perhaps a sufficiently advanced civilization would have made an inventory of the music of species on many planets, and by comparing our music with such a library, might be able to deduce a great deal about us, close quote. In writing this, perhaps Sagan had in mind Alan Lomax, whom the Voyager Interstellar Record Committee had consulted on the final selection of music. For Lomax was a prominent ethnomusicologist who had developed an ambitious cantometrics project, as he called it, which inventoried and measured global musics to correlate the variety of musical styles to diverse social organizations and socio-psychological factors that Lomax thought would surely shape habitual musical practices. It is characteristic, though, of Sagan's expansive imagination that he recasts Lomax's project as a potentially intergalactic study conducted by unknown intelligences. But Sagan's cosmic vision rested on ancient authority. Quote again from Murmurs of Earth, the connection between music and mathematics has been marked at least since the time of Pythagoras. But so far as we can tell, mathematical relationships should be valid for all planets, biologies, cultures, and philosophies. As an intellectual historian, I can't help but hear in Sagan's claim the resonance of a nearly identical sentiment expressed in the late 17th century by Christian Huygens, an astronomer and mathematician best known as the inventor of the pendulum clock and the discoverer of Saturn's moon Titan. In Huygens' posthumous publication, Cosmotheoros, or Cosmic Visions, Huygens envisioned an intellectual and philosophical kinship between ourselves and unknown planetarians, as he called the probable inhabitants of other worlds. Quote, geometry is of such a nature that its principles and foundations must be immutably the same in all times and places. It is the same with music as with geometry. It is everywhere immutably the same and always will be so. So Ma Sagan's mathematically confident post-humanism has had a long history. But Sagan knew this too, as did the entire team that compiled the rec record, for included as the first sonic encounter in the sounds of Earth collage is a computer synthesized sonification of the music of the spheres the orbital velocities of the planets in our solar system realized at Bell Laboratories by Laurie Spiegel. And I should add that she is, in fact, the only named female composer on the record, the named female composer on the record. And I offer this not as a criticism, but just to mark, as I think Carl Sagan would himself, that the golden record is a record of its time. And if we listen now to Spiegel's harmony of the world, we cannot help but hear echoes of piercing air raid sirens, an acoustic reminder, perhaps, of the Cold War politics that also echo in President Carter's words that are imaged on the other side of the record. We are attempting to survive our times so that we can live into yours. Spiegel's digital sonification encodes the planetary data that was published in Johannes Kepler's 1619 Harmonicae Mundi, or Harmony of the World. So it is yet another unfolding or infolding of humanity's most future forward, far-flung effort back upon its long historical imagination. Kepler is best known for his articulation of the three laws of planetary motion. I won't quiz you on it now, but often forgotten is that he devised those laws in a hunt for a mathematically proven musical universe. For Kepler's laws issue from a contrapuntal planetary science with Earth, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mercury, as you see here, all singing their own tunes in their variegated orbits. And Kepler's music has now literally mounted again to the skies. For the music of the spheres has reverted again to a data stream, now etched as a waveform within the copper substrate of a long playing record, now more than 81 trillion feet from Earth. The golden record is a monument to humanity, imperfect though it may be. 
It is a gambit on post-humanity, unanswered as it may be. And it is but one of the many testimonies to the legacy of Carl Sagan, who lived a life of science, imagination, and humanism well beyond the scale of the human. Thank you.